We start from the, the live stream. Here we are, class number one. Now we got the class. Um, and I got all this ready, and I don't know quite how to begin. Um, what's the what's the inspiration for this class, Jerry? You you were the one that first mentioned this to me. What was it? What what was it about this topic that became fascinating? Well, I was thinking not so much about how we got the Bible, although that's great information, and I've never had the opportunity to have it presented, so I, I look forward to it. I was thinking more sort of at the end of it, uh, the persecution of the people who translated the Bible into useful languages, and the, the martyrs, the pioneers who went before and got the Bible in a form that we know it today, and, 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 and around the world. Uh, where it can be usable instead of locked into access to only a few. That's actually going to be part of the story. That's actually part of this. Uh, in fact, as I was getting ready for this, um, you know, we have, all of us, we have friends. We have people who are involved in the same process today that gave us the Bible um, centuries ago. I mean, essentially, our Bible translators who are working to put the Bible into the language of people who can understand it, that's the same process that gave us the scriptures that we now have. Um, there's obviously some things at the start of it that come about a little differently. Um, we know this much, and I'm not going to worry about whether I'm on camera or not. They can hear me, and that's fine. We know this much. We know that the first words that were written scripture, I'm going to say, are written by the finger of God uh, uh, for Moses, for the people. And that's when you actually go to the writing of scripture. And so we have this, this, this piece of what we call our scriptures, that in its original form, it is written by the finger of God on the stone tablets, and those stone tablets are kept, and they're wherever the Ark of the Covenant is. As for the rest of it, there are processes, human processes, that involve the divine work that are constantly going on. Because... You know, this this scripture that, that you and I have, I mean, these, these books, these digital records, whatever they are, um, it seems like there's there's often kind of a debate between, well, you know, is, is this a work of God or is this a work of, of people, a human one? And I think that's the wrong question. Because God's modus operandi has always been his, his way of doing things. You know, he'll do his miracles. He'll, he'll write on stone. But most of the time, God will work with and cooperate with humanity in ways that make us realize he is God. And so there's a process at work here that turns into this deposit of wisdom and teaching in Scripture that, that has been transmitted over the ages. Um, and we're going to look into some of that uh, as, we, as we go here. Um, so the first thing, I think, let me begin with this, and, and then I, I'll, I'll, I'll put a little bit out here on the table, and then, you know, I, I don't want you to get shy. I want you to think about this and think about a question. I'll have some exercises next week that I think we'll do that, I hope we'll illustrate this because this is the um, this is the sort of stuff that, that it, it, we don't always think about it. We just assume that scripture's there, but it's fascinating to think about how we got this. And I, that's why I have to call my first lesson a salute to the scribes. Um, here's an analysis of your modern Bible. This is what you've got. If you if you had a uh, a nutritional label on the back of your Bible, it might look something like this. 75.55% of it is what we call Old Testament. Uh, that, that, if you do the math with uh, 39 versus 27, you're going to get a different number. This is the content, okay? 
24.45% of it is New Testament. Now you've got 39 or 24 individual documents in the Old Testament, depending on who's doing the counting. When we're doing the counting, good Protestants that we are, it's 39 documents. When the, um, when the Jewish community, the traditional Orthodox Jewish community is doing the counting, we want to get that door. Yeah. It's 24 because what we divide into 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings just becomes Kings, just becomes Samuel. They were originally one book. Um, they also take the 12, what we call minor prophets, they just kind of put them all together. That becomes one whole book. So that brings your total down. The view of the Jewish community concerned, because they don't call it the Old Testament, for them it's the Bible. Um, they call it the, the Tanakh. That's, that's these three letters right here in Hebrew turned into an acronym. Okay? And uh, it stands for Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim. The law and the prophets. And think about the, the terminology that we often see Jesus using in the New Testament. He'll say the law and the prophets. He's talking about scripture. The writings is a third part. And by the way, these have a, a priority. The Torah is considered base. That's, that's the solid part. The prophets comment on this, and then the writings comment on all of it. They build on one another. It's not that one's more important than one isn't. It's that they're all important, but they all depend on each other. There's a core to it. Okay, It's got, it's got layers. It's got a foundation. We'll get into the New Testament later. But think about the span of time that you've got covered here when it comes just to the writing. With what we call the Old Testament, you've got 15th century to 2nd century B.C. That means you've got about you know, easily a thousand years, a millennium worth of writings. From the Exodus all the way up to a few hundred years before Jesus. <clears throat> With what we call the New Testament, it all takes place in one century doesn't even necessarily cover the whole century. It's within a lifetime that you see it's right. That's going to that's gonna change how we've inherited those things. That means that some of your Old Testament writings are familiar with some of your earlier Old Testament writings. They come about at a different time. In fact, Ezra is our prototypical scribe. He's our first real scribe. He's the basis for all scribes. Ezra knows about Scripture. Ezra, who's in the Bible, and his book, Ezra and Ezra and Nehemiah, get fused into one book in the, in the Hebrew canon. Ezra knows about Scripture. He's like the director showing up in his own movie, and he's a character. But this is the, the span of time. Now, there's that little mention at the end of the New Testament where, where Peter mentions Paul's writings. But that's not even close to this. I mean, it's not like it's not like Paul steps into it. Because Ezra is responsible then for getting these scriptures together so that the people can re remember what God's word is. Then there's that, that wonderful uh, account of how they read the scripture to the people. And they're, they're, they're cherishing it. It's important. Uh, even the kings are familiar with scripture. In Deuteronomy 17, you read that when the king takes the throne of his kingdom, he's to write for himself on a scroll a copy of the law taken from the Levitical priest. The king himself becomes a scribe. And writing that law becomes a discipline so that the king knows that law. <clears throat> the, the scribal work is, is within the scope of the, the, the people in the Bible that we know about and even in the ages after. So there's a, there's a dialogue with some of the rabbis in the Jewish tradition. Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Meir is the younger one. He's In, in this little dialogue, um, Rabbi Meir is talking about the work of the scribe and, and what he does. And this is just the context. And he's saying, well, I put iron sulfite in my ink. That makes it durable so that it doesn't erase. You know, they're just talking about the practical in and out. Rabbi Ishmael is not a big fan of iron sulfite. He says, no, you don't do that because the scripture says you've got to be able to blot this out. 
But then he says, Rabbi Ishmael says to him, My son, what is your vocation? And Rabbi Meir says, I am a scribe who writes Torah scrolls. And Rabbi Ishmael, the older teaching rabbi, says to him, My son, be careful in your vocation, as your vocation is heavenly service. And care must be taken, lest you omit a single letter or add a single letter out of place, and, and you will end up destroying the whole world in its entirety. There's your job description of a scribe from Rabbi Ishmael. Get one letter wrong, people's worlds change. And then they have this, in the dialogue, they have this little, little illustration. The addition or the omission of a single letter can change the meaning from truth to death. And I've reproduced the words here for you in Hebrew. There's the word for truth. There's the word for death. <clears throat> now, you would look at those in Hebrew, and you would know that uh, truth is emet. Death is mot. That doesn't sound like. They're just one letter off, because those letters carry a lot of freight in Hebrew. They don't have vowels. You just got the consonant sound. So the scribe's work is even more challenging. You know, they want to buy a vow. They can't buy a vow. It's in Wheel of Fortune. They're scribes. Here's where textual criticism comes into this. I want to talk a little bit about this because <clears throat> there's a lot of buzzwords today uh, about uh, deconstruction. And I, I, don't, I don't understand it. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not following with it. I'm not up to speed on it. Uh, everything's being deconstructed. It sounds negative. Some people are trying to use it positively. I think they just like the word deconstruction. It's kind of marketing. Uh, but there's an older term for this process. It's called textual criticism. Of course, that sounds bad because it's like criticism. We're not supposed to be critical, are we? Okay. It's not the negative critical. <clears throat> it means that we're using a insightful process to think about things. Okay, It's analysis. And I like this graphic from this fellow named C. Michael Patton. He... he he, he simplified this, and this is very simplistic. You've got one, two, three, four. You've got the original writings. You've got the copies of the writings. Then you have critical text that scholars have put together. And then you have the translation. So a translation would be what our friends are doing in other parts of the world who are translating scripture. And then what you have right here, because English was not one of the original Bible words, okay? Or Bible languages. The way he says it is, we work with number two, these copies, to produce a number three. In other words, we're collating all of them, we're looking at all the differences, and then we're putting in our little notes and everything so we can come up with a number three. So that then, we believe that number three accurately represents number one, which we don't have access to because they don't exist anymore. So we're trying to get to this so that we can then make a number four. And that's the process. And that's been the process for a long time. Okay, now it really picks up in the, um, in the 19th century. And a lot of the work that I did in graduate school was centered around textual criticism. And my professor was involved in text critical studies. And I even got to you know, collate some of the manuscripts uh, that were out there in Greek. <laughs> but um, and work with some of the translations. And it's a daunting work. And it was daunting even then, back in the 90s, because we didn't have the computer technology that you've got now that can do this very quickly. But even that isn't going to solve anything because you still have to have a human process involved in it. Because it's on one side it's science, but on the other side it's art. Because you have to make you have to make informed judgments about, well, why do we favor this one instead of that one? Because if you just make simple statements, and you'll hear these simple statements all the time, people will say, well, you know, <clears throat> there's 24,000 uh, copies out there that don't have this word in it. So what? 24,000 people can be wrong. One person can be right. You have to know why you want to favor the minority position over the majority position. And there's good reasons to know, and it's possible to know that. Okay. So, let me pause right here because we're throwing a lot at you. Any questions right now? Tracking? How's it going? Don't be afraid of YouTube, all right? <laughs> Talk to me. 
No, this is good. It's interesting, helpful. All right, questions? Am I got a question? Nope. I, I like, I'd like to know how you today know what you can rely on when you go through that four-step process. You know, we, we, we know in the United States we've got the King James Version mm -hmm. with the these and the thous that we've <laughs> got it backed off of. We've got the message. Uh, I, I read something <clears throat> online the other day about, uh, I guess, a Hebrew scholar. He was talking about God making a covenant. Yeah. It, it translates God makes. He said, when you look at the original word, it's cuts. Yeah. And he said, that makes sense in the, in the language of their day because somebody would cut up an animal mm -hmm. to, to give it to somebody. And that, when, when I learned make versus cuts, that's a world of difference yeah. in the world that we live in. You cut a covenant. And, uh, and, and that, we're going we're gonna to get into that. We probably won't get onto that tonight, but we will start that. I love that question. And these questions, you're helping me. Y'all are like my compass. You're helping me point this in the right direction because there's so much of this, and we're going to skim skim it but we got a few weeks and we are going to get into that because that's one of my favorite topics a lot of that has to do with you know the, the the hebrew phrase would have been you're going to cut a covenant okay we use terms like that all the time and we're unaware of it. uh i was talking to um oscar nelasco um years ago one day and, and talking about the process you have to go through for citizenship and <clears throat> when i'm talking to him i just said yeah i guess you got to you know deal with a lot of red tape and I said, well, you know, Cinco Rojo, red tape, I know Spanish. He's like, what? Red tape, what? And the phrase didn't make any sense. And it comes from, you know, they would put the red tape on these documents, and, and it's, it's isolated to a particular culture. So those are the idiomatic expressions that sometimes don't translate, but you have to make a jump. You can do it literally. But it still won't communicate anything. And, and that, that's the work of translators. They have to think about this. And all of the translators that we're going to see here, that they have decisions to make. How much, of the, how much of the original flavor of the language do you maintain? And how much of it do you carry over? And sometimes you don't have to make decisions. You do a variety of things. But in that vein, we talk about the Bible as being the inspired word of God. Mm -hmm. But now you've got four steps. So... The original writer presumably was inspired. Yep. You then get into the hard copy. You get into the and, and are you saying that each and every person along the line over several thousands of years, every one of them in translating, etc., all were inspired? Yeah, I believe it. I really do. I mean, I I I, I don't think that inspiration means that. Uh, God has to be up here, uh, you know, controlling this like trains on a train track, like a little toy train. I don't, I don't, you know, we, we don't, we don't have, you know, any golden plates that fell out of heaven or anything like that, you know. We, but I do think that there is a way in which God is involved in this living process with us because he's, he's always coming close to us. And the, and the greatest revelation is in Jesus Christ and Jesus' words are picked up and carried by the apostles and then it's turned into the gospels and then it's carried over by Paul. So yeah, there's some kind of process there and his spirit, you know, if inspiration really means the involvement of the spirit of God, then why isn't God's spirit involved through that whole process? So. Well, and, and language may change in one generation. And sure. we, we quit using biblical terms, but you don't have to go back far to where there's a lot of phrases from the Bible that were in everyday language. Yeah. Like this deal about uh, uh, making a covenant or cutting a covenant. We still use the term cut a deal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, the same, that's the same deal. Probably translates differently in other languages. Here's yeah. one thing, here's another thought about inspiration. I like that question. Uh, well, let's go back to what Rabbi... Ishmael told Rabbi Meir, he said, your vocation is a heavenly service. Now, we, we use the term inspired, and sometimes we get the, the term, uh, we get terms kind of mixed together that inspired and authoritative. Now, 
Those go together, but they're not exactly the same thing. Inspiration is the process by which God is involved in this. Authoritative is that we understand the weight and the, and the, the impact and the, uh, I'm trying to think of cognitive authority, but you know, you get the it. It's, it's the gravitas. Yeah, the gravitas and the, the ultimate decision-making power of this work. Now, those go together, but they're unique. Here, they've got this idea that keeping this word and faithfully sharing this word and copying this word is a heavenly service. So they, they definitely have God in mind throughout this. Uh, here's, here's kind of what, this is a simplified version of it. This is my attempt to, to do something. That one, two, three, four was probably better. But what you really end up with is, you end up with kind of this uh, genealogical network. So that, and this is, this is, by the way, this is meant to show that despite all of this, and this is the thing that when you stay in textual criticism, when you keep thinking about it, despite all this complexity, the text is very reliable. And that's what's amazing about the whole thing. I mean, it'd be just simpler if God would just, you know, have written everything with his finger on stone and just said, here, here it is. You know, there's everything you need right there. Here it is, skywriting, you know, whatever. Here's a magic scroll. And we could all go to it and say, look at that. There's the magic original that God gave us. But for whatever reason, it's brought to us, you know, in the words of Hebrews, uh, he spoke to us through prophets and angels, but finally he's spoken to us through his son. The word comes to us as a living word, as a spoken word. In fact, inspired has to do with respiration, being the breath. And the word as it's presented to us is spoken with air, with breath that filled the lungs of the Son of God and he speaks on the Sermon on the Mount. And that's how this word is shared. It gets written down to preserve it. But the idea that it's spoken first is what matters. And then it's carried on by others. This copying process, you've got the originals like, uh, let's just use New Testament because it's a little easier to, to, to grasp New Testament. Paul writes a letter. Paul writes a letter, and that's the original autograph. It goes out to its intended recipients, and they make copies of it. They don't even say in the New Testament, we'll look at this in a couple of weeks. You know, you, you share the copy of this letter with that church, and then ask them for a copy of their letter. So people are copying the letters. They're preserving it. And that's the only thing. You've got to do it by hand. Can't email it. Can't attach it. Can't resend it. No Xerox machine. So they have to write it down, and they have to be faithful. And there's this there's this sense of being careful, which is kind of a lost art because you know autocorrect hasn't helped us. It just garbles communication. I get texts from some people, and I'm like, it's like, okay, we're gonna have to go back to the beginning. You know, I'm doing text criticism on my phone. All the time. So anyway, uh, but you have copies then, and then you, you have other copies, and, and different people are making these copies. And then there's copies of the copies. And then at some point, that collection gets around. And, and by the way, the Bibles are not kept as um, one single book holding it all. You may have a church over here, and they've got a copy of some of the books. You have a church over here, they've got a copy of some of the others. And I'm talking about Old Testament first, because the, the first century church their Bible is what we call the Old Testament. Now they're hearing the gospel. The gospel is being taught. And the letters of Paul are being circulated. And so by the time you get to the second century, there, there's, there's an awareness of all these other accounts that are being passed on. Luke describes the process to us. We're going to get into that too because there's some, there's some <laughs> rather... Um, Troubling, and I don't mean troubling in a way that I'm alarmed by it. It's actually, there's this idea that uh, the church in the fourth century decides which books it wants and it kicks out the ones that don't follow with their agenda, and so there's all these lost books of the Bible. <clears throat> this is always going to come up around Easter and Christmas. You know, everybody's going to tell you, oh, there's lost books of the Bible. They tell us about the real Jesus. That's silly, and that's been, they knew about that from the get go. And these books were not banned from the Bible. These books were read, and everybody said, these are terrible. I mean, you know, a few people were trying to push that book. They had an agenda. They were like, no, that's not, that's not the way it is. 
They had to teach it. Well, anyway, that you've got to translate it at some point because people, they want to get this word out. So it's like, well, these people over here, they don't speak Greek. Well, let's get it into their language. And so language translations are made. Now, in a much broader process, that's done with the Old Testament as yeah. well. Can I ask a question yeah. there? Yep. Yeah. We realize there's a fairly limited number of copies and even versions of the New Testament scriptures. Right. But the Hebrew scriptures are much, much older. What's the, how many of those first level versions are there of the Hebrew scriptures or of significant parts of it? Well, I'm going to give you a number. Um, what I understand is it's on the order of 24,000. But I'll tell you this, now that's just different manuscripts. They don't have the whole Bible. But what I have learned is, the question's a little more complex than that, because with the Old Testament, you get past this, and even the copies of the originals, and then the copies of the copies, and this is condensed, the copies of the copies of the copies, we don't have those anymore. So we take what we have, and we try to look at them all and say, okay, look, do we have a faithful witness <coughs> To the original, we're we're collecting it, and this is just like you know, the, the the legal forensic metaphor may be very appropriate here. You take your witnesses and you cross-examine and you look at it. It's like, okay, does this fit? Do we have you know, do we have a consistent witness to something? And that's what usually stands up. That, what, that, that is what stands up. Hang on. Yep. I've got a question about the previous one, too. Okay. <clears throat> and, and, and please comment on this. It seems like the translators <clears throat> will have copy A and copy G. Yeah. Copy G2, let's say. Okay, that's more recent. No, that's more recent. Let's say that's centuries later. Yeah. But the translator will tend to go to copy A and say, well, it's the older one, so we're going to accept that if there's a word different, they're going to accept the one out of A because rather than G two. But who's to say that A is correct and C wasn't correct? Maybe C was correct. That's right. And A was not correct, and C it got passed down with the right word. Yep. So one of the translators so often want to accept A over G two when there's a hundred that are like G2, and there's just a handful that are like A. Well, okay, that's a good question. Here, here's a way of understanding it. Keep in mind, too, this is like the, the model of the atom. This is not how it is, but it'll work for us. These, by the way, a version is the same thing as a translation. Now, flipping your question a little bit, we might be surprised that it's like, wait a second, that was in Hebrew, and this is in Latin. But we're going to take the Latin over an earlier Hebrew? Why would we do that? Okay. Just like your witnesses. If you're trying to recreate a, a story or a testimony and you go to your witnesses, you find out that on the whole, this witness tends to be more reliable than this witness. Or you find out that this witness has a bias. And because of that bias, you have to filter that out. You know, when you when you start examining your witnesses, you find out that, okay, well, this witness has a connection that may favor it. It's like, well, of course they're going to know more. You know, they, they, they were closer to the scene or closer to what's going on. Or that might work against it, and we might realize, oh, no, wait a second. We have to take this with a grain of salt because we know what their their, their basic bias is. And you're going to see that with some. I, I, can, I can tell you more on the New Testament stuff, why we like certain certain texts over other texts. Uh, and a lot of that comes with getting to know these texts and what we also call text families. They have a, there is a tradition that works here. Um, Aren't you also looking at agreement with other writers? Yes. Yeah. And then sometimes when you have a difference, that difference points to something. So let's say you have a discrepancy. Well, then you weigh the discrepancy. It's like, well, wait a second. What, what, what is this discrepancy? One of the classic ones with the Old Testament is how tall is Goliath? Is he, you know, is he nine six or is he six nine? Well, the, when you look at which translations are saying nine six, they all tend to agree with each other, and there's a strong t tradition there. But there's a very early 
text from the Dead Sea Scrolls that shrinks Goliath down to 6'9". Still big. But, you know, it shrinks him down. Okay, so then there's a couple of, of possibilities. Maybe somewhere in this other tradition where he's 9'6", um, no, no, wait, I'm sorry, backwards, the other way around. This earlier text in, the, the scribe who's starting that set of copies is about to go 9'6", and then his eye jumps ahead to the 600-pound uh, armor and shield and spear, and he picks up that six and, and you know, kind of blows his, his uh, copy in and he doesn't catch it. All right, that's one possibility. I, I don't like it. I think it's too complicated. But there's another possibility that that particular text that's making it 6-9, this is interesting, is taking a dig at salt. Because Saul was the tallest man in Israel. Could have been well over 60. And the fact that Saul wouldn't go out and face Goliath, even though he could have been just a straight physical match for him, makes Saul out to be an even bigger coward than he was. And less faithful and trusting in God than the little David from the child. Okay, now that would mean that 6-9 is an alteration to the original. All right. But we can understand why they might have done it. In the end, we really don't know. And in the end, Goliath's still big. And it doesn't, and that's the other thing, it doesn't affect the core teaching. Now, there's another uh, classic Old Testament um, textual criticism problem, and this comes about with the arrival of the Dead Sea Scrolls, where You've got a passage in Isaiah where it says that uh, God's righteous ones will see, and then there's another version that says they will see the light. And that seems to point towards resurrection. Um, and see the light seems to be a better one. Of course, there is a little bit of a theological weight hanging on that, because it could be support for resurrection, and we like that. We're going to have to wait and get into that one, because I don't want to get you headed off in the wrong direction on that one. All right. Want me to move on? Because I think I'll clarify some of that as we go. You have to know, first of all, who you're working with. Who are your witnesses you know, to the Hebrew manuscripts? We're going to vet our witnesses. We're going to bring them in. We're going to say, okay, who are you? And why do you have anything to say about the original manuscript? And these three witnesses come in and they say, oh, we've seen it. We've seen it. Back there in our history, we've seen it. And here's what they are. You're going to see this in your scripture, in your audio footnotes, in your English scripture, and it'll say the Masoretic text has, you've probably been wondering, what on earth a Masoretic text? Where is this Masoretic text? It's not anywhere, because it's not really a text. It is a assemblage of a certain group of texts, which could be on the order of five digits, okay? Maybe not quite 24,000, but quite a few because they've been copied and distributed. The printed version of the, and when you get into the, the, the 15th century, now you've got the printing press. Now you can start printing the Hebrew Bible in the Jewish communities. The Masoretic text becomes the the authorized, it's, it's basically the King James of that community. What we know about the Masoretic text, all the documents that we've gone out there and the ones that we know about right now, I'm going to tell you a little story about some of that, um, is everything from the 9th century to about the 14th century with the printing press, you're, you're getting up there into the Middle Ages, all of our documents are still in the A.D. side of things, that's as old as they are. Anything older than that doesn't really survive, or we haven't found it yet. Okay, we'll come back to that. We have found some, some documents that are older than that, and they're called the Proto-Masoretic Text. The real difference is these have vowels and these don't. They call it the Silent Era because there's not very many texts yet. Because all of this changes around 1947 because a little Bedouin kid finds a bunch of scrolls in a cave in Qumran that predate the Masoretic text. 
by almost a thousand years, or at least all the surviving copies. Now, the Masoretic text was probably around a lot earlier than that. Uh, and it's working off of stuff that goes on before that. Plus, we've also got the other translations that predate that. You'll see. We're going to line up. So we're going to bring some more witnesses in. Let's talk about each one of these. I want you to be familiar with them. Know who our witnesses are. The Masoretes, this is what that Masoretic text is. <clears throat> this is part of the world, this is part of it. This is a history that we don't really get into unless it's all this current event stuff. But here's what you need to know. Masoretes is a term that means the masters of tradition. They are the scribes. They're the ones who are faithfully keeping this text. They're the ones who are making sure that they don't omit a single letter. And they're the ones that are sitting around talking about how you copy these texts. And they are very serious about it. They are scribes and scholars who are working on this. There are families that are working on correcting it, correcting and editing, making sure that every written copy matches up. So there are people taking it seriously. From about the 5th century, that's the 400s, to about the 900s. They're operating out of Tiberias, up here around the Sea of Galilee, in this little area. And they're doing this during... Part of their history, they're doing this during the, the when the Muslim Empire, uh, the caliphates, are, are running this part of the world at that point. Okay, um, they're also working down here in Jerusalem, and uh, you can see there. There's the old name, the old uh, I can't remember what you call that empire, but Philistines. Philistines. Yeah. But it's not Philistines. It's actually Palestine. It's the forerunner of the word Palestine. But but this would be the, uh, the period of um, uh, you know, the caliphates and the, the Ottoman Empire. Is yeah, that what you're well, thinking? Even before that, before that. But here they are, and these Masoretes are working with this, and of course, culture's changing around them, and they're realizing that people don't read this as well as they used to, and they're very serious about it. So they're the ones that invent these little dots and dashes, so that you know. Because someone who didn't need it would look at that and they'd go, oh, yeah, yeah, homasero. But you don't have that up here, so you don't know what these contents. So, ha, ma, so, ra. Masoretes, that's what that means. They help you out. They tell you how to read it. they got a lot of other little symbols they put in the text because they want people reading this right because they're serious about the word of God. So anything that the Masoretes do, we like it because they're very reliable witnesses. And this Masoretic text, which represents, we've, we've gotten all of these copies, and we look at them, and they tend to be very accurate. It's like, wow, this really does line up, and there's a consistency. That's what we call it. The Masoretic text is made up of all of these documents. We've combined them, collated them, looked at them. And we're like, wow, that's kind of the standard. Okay. Now, you go back and you look at its forerunner. Or no, wait, these are some examples of it. Like I said, it's not a single text. It's a standard. There you go. That's a good word for it. The oldest that we know of, 925, Aleppo Codex. That's named after Aleppo, Syria. Um, unfortunately, a big portion of it got destroyed in 1947. Uh, there was some kind of anti-Semitic riot going on in Syria. Fire breaks out. Burn up part of his body. Well, then we thought, okay, well, we're going to have to rely on Codex Leningrad. And that's right around a thousand. Guess what? Last year, this Codex Sassoon goes on sale at Sotheby's, May 2023. Sells for $38.1 million. Private owner named uh, David Sassoon in the early part of the 20th century owned this, this document. They carbon date it and find out it's just as old as Codex Aleppo and it's just about all complete. And it's got an interesting history. So there could be manuscripts out there that are in the hands of private collectors and we may still discover them. But every time we do, now that we're actually getting a look at Codex Sassoon Knights, we've known about it for a while. And I say we, I talk scholarship. But the thing is, every time you look into these and you look into them more carefully, they don't contradict the Masoretic text. They support it. 
I mean, every time you get a new witness, the story keeps coming up the same. And this is why every time they break the news on one of these, it's like, oh, a new document is found that will shatter what we think about Scripture. No, it, it hardly ever does. I mean, we've had a lot of these discoveries in the 20th century, and it tends to point towards reliability. I, I, so, so be careful of that breaking news when you hear it. Same with the uh, proto... Uh, these guys are incredible. These are incredible incredibly precise and they match up. Uh, they're just an earlier version. They don't have vowel points. We'll move on. There's nothing there. Let's talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls, because that's what gets all the attention. You know? Everybody will tell you that the secrets of Atlantis are in the Dead Sea Scrolls and all that. You know, I mean, Anybody can just cite the Dead Sea Scrolls and they've never read it. You know? Dead Sea Scrolls predict that you know, what's going to happen in the 21st century and what's going to happen in the 2024 election. You know? No, they don't. No, they don't. Um, <laughs> the Dead Sea Scrolls, we know what's in them, and we've read them. And what's so interesting and fascinating about them is that they're old. Now, we think we know who collected these, but you can only know so much. Here's what happened. These caves out in Qumran, uh, like this little cave right here. There's a big one lad named Muhammad Ahmed el-Hamid, 1946. He's out there looking for his lost goat or sheep or something, you know. Goes in this little cave and finds these scrolls. Goes and tells an elder of his tribe. They take it to this Christian um, monk. On oh, that story, it's fascinating how yeah, they discover this. And I don't even, I'm not going to get it accurate right now, but I mean, they just, they just, they're looking into this. And of course, one of the things that's come along is they're like, this is going to be worth a lot. How do we sell this? Then the archaeologists get involved, and, and it, they, they're like, oh, wow. And then they, they're like, okay, there's caves out there that have scrolls. That's the big discovery. Somebody hid their scrolls out in these caves, and these things are old. They go back to the second century before Christ, some of them. <clears throat> so they go out there and start searching these caves. They eventually find 12 caves. In fact, the most recent cave was discovered, any guesses? 2017. Sadly, when they found the cave, they didn't find any scrolls. It's so sad. They found pickaxes and shovels, so somebody had gotten in there in the 1950s and already looted it. But that means that there may still be scrolls out there. These are just great things to find. And there's always a lot of controversy over this. And the controversy comes from the fact and everybody's hanging on to who gets to publish this. Now, it started to loosen up, and they're getting the information out there. Because everybody's like, we want the information, but you know, folks are, are holding on to it. And it's slow moving. I mean, think about that. These were discovered in 1946. They didn't just upload them to Instagram. You know, like, um, so there's a meticulous work going on. They're older than the Masoretic text documents. They're older. But here's the thing, when we start looking at it, and there's a, there's a complete scroll of Isaiah in the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's one of the treasures of it. It matches up with the Masoretic text pretty well. And it does differ at points. But where it differs at points, that creates interesting insights into what's going on. It's like, why did they have that word instead of this word? Why did they copy it like that? Or why did they transmit it like that? And I want you to know this. It does not create doubt about scripture it actually shows you that scripture is a living process and that scripture is real Hebrew can be a very metaphorical language remember one letter can change all the meaning and sometimes that's what happens and so we're getting helped every time we have a manuscript but we still you know, there's still every reason to believe that what we've got representing the Old Testament is a reliable addition of what was out there. The meaning of it is, is sound. Sometimes the differences are spelling errors. You know, it's, it's stuff like that, or maybe leaving off a word or, or putting an article in where there's not. You know, it, it's, it's, it usually tends to be stuff that it's not that critical. Okay. Those were our witnesses in Hebrew. All of those were in Hebrew. We're going to have 10 minutes. <clears throat> but 
guess what? While all that Hebrew's out there, the people who love the Bible, the people of God who read the Bible, they're learning different languages. So by the time of Alexander the Great, he starts taking over the world, everybody's speaking Greek. You start speaking Hebrew, people are like, oh. I got a great story from Ethiopia. Um, you know, they speak so many languages over there. And back in 2013, I'm, I'm, I'm riding around with Alamayu. And I'm in the truck with Alamayu, and we got the three um, Aromo speaking brothers in the back. They're back there talking Aromo. Now I'm, I'm two languages away from that Aromo. Okay? English to Amharic, they're, they're common language to Aromo. Alamayu can speak English and Amharic. I said, Alamayu. You have any idea what they're saying? His word to me in English is not a word. He doesn't know Romo. He's not, he's not, he's not picking up any of the Romo. And he may be. Here's the thing. It's just like that. They live in the same country, same tradition. The language can be a barrier. That happens in the ancient world. And Greek becomes the, the standard language. So what we need is we find times where we've got to translate the Old Testament into Greek, into Latin, into Syriac. We'll talk about these two. We may save this for next week because they're pretty special, but um, different. Man, this one. All right. How are we doing? All right. Place your glass. Greek version, because it's important. Greek version, you'll see that a lot in your notes, in your Bible, because it will say, the Masoretic text says this. But the Septuagint says this, or it might say LXX. What is that? I'm going to tell you a little story about the Septuagint because I want you to understand what it is. It gets its name, Septuagint, that's, that's uh, Latin for seven, and then this is the new Roman numeral for 70. Its name means the work of the 70 translators. The legend is, and it comes from this old document called the Letter of Aristides, which is probably a bit of a myth. But that's okay. Don't worry about that. That doesn't mean to excite us. Legend says that this king over Egypt, Ptolemy II, he's got the library in Alexandria in the third century BC, and he wants he, he he wants a copy of the Jewish scriptures for his library. So he says, "Would you please send me some translators so that they can translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek?" And 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 uh, legend has it that he got six translators from every one of the twelve tribes, which could have been hard to do in the third century. But he, he gets them all in there. He puts them in different rooms. And he says, now translate. But they don't know about the work that the others are doing. And lo and behold, when they're done and the out it, out it pops, it's all across the boards exactly the way it should be. 70 translators, do 72 actually, do it in 70 days. And the letter, supposedly from King Ptolemy to his brother, is, this is amazing. All right. I think that's a bit of salesmanship. But there is a sentence. There really is a, these Alexandrian Jews who have adopted this Greek culture. You remember in Acts, we read about the Hellenistic Jews. They have adopted Greek culture, but they're still maintaining their, their identity. And there's an identity crisis in around that time in the, in the second and first century B.C. Uh, read the book of Maccabees. They find the need to translate Hebrew scriptures into Greek so that people can understand. And that's what I love about this whole story overall. There's always this desire to know the Bible, know the Bible. We're not just going to keep it in Hebrew because that's the way it's supposed to be. Let's get it out there. So thanks to their work, and by the way, here's a little, this is an old fragment of a, of a Greek translation. Old. And right here you'll notice, that, you know, this is all, I don't, you can say it's all Greek to me, and that's Greek letters and all that. It's just handwritten. But right here, these letters look a little funny. That's the name of God. And it's written in the ancient Hebrew letters. Not those blocky looking ones that we're used to seeing. They would do that. They would do that sometimes. They would write God's name as it, you know, as it originally appeared. There's all kinds of traditions on how you handle God's name. Well, on the other side of things, fourth century, we've got this fellow named Jerome. He's a saint in the Catholic Church. Um, he, he, he starts translating the Hebrew text into Latin. 
Now, there was a Latin Old Testament around, but they had translated it out of the Greek that was earlier. Jerome is a pretty sharp fella, and he says, you know, it might make more sense if it came right out of Hebrew. So he studies Hebrew. He, he, he goes to Jewish people to learn Hebrew, and then he, he translates it from Hebrew directly into Latin, and he comes up with a version of it. Uh, it's called, and I don't know Latin, it's like the Hebrew study of which means according to the Hebrew so now he's given us this Latin version, but this Latin version is one step removed from Hebrew instead of two steps removed. It's like me in Ethiopia. i got to go from English to Amharic to Aroma. What if all of a sudden I could speak Aramaic? Aha, now I'm only one step removed. That's, what, that's the gift that Jerome gives us. So we've still got his Latin copies of his Latin translation around. We can read it back translate it and find out what he was reading in Hebrew just like we do with the Greek now right. we've got more witnesses by the time you get to the 300s and mm -hmm. you talk about the Hebrew text yeah. are you talking about the entire Old Testament as we know it today or are you simply talking about the first five books of the Old Testament no what, what is the Hebrew text that he's translating by the 4th century AD you would have all the documents that we know about and he might even be doing a few additional ones that uh, are not anonymous. So he's aware of that. Now, if you go back to the Greek, there might be some that are on the line, like the Book of Esther. The Book of Esther is always, it's a little later in the, in the, uh, the history. But Jerome's going to know about all of this. Um, and the Hebrew that he's working out of, this predates the work of the Masoretic text. So he, you, you, you think of it like this. The Masoretes have put together a Hebrew witness for us. Jerome comes along, and he's earlier than them, and he says, oh, I saw Hebrew texts, and here's what I saw. We don't, you know, we have his notes, so to speak. But he's going to know all the books that we're familiar with uh, by that time period. Yeah. And his interest in doing this is because the early church its Bible for 400 <coughs> years, for a good portion of that time, was what we call the Old Testament. Uh, books like the, the Torah, the Pentateuch, uh, Deuteronomy, those were very important to the early church. Uh, Job was very important to the early church. The Psalms were highly important to the early church. In fact, we've got these collections of traveling documents that, that we know existed within the early church, and sometimes they'll be the, the most interesting collections. It'll be like Deuteronomy, Job, and some of the Psalms, or uh, Exodus, and, and it's really, and you know, the reason why is because they gathered what they could, when they could. And when you think of the process, that's another thing that's almost humbling in this, the process by which ancient people, how hard they work to get scripture. I mean, look, he devotes 14 years of his life to doing this. Not to make a penny. It's because he believes he's engaged in a holy task. And, and what was the time of the Septuagint as compared to... Oh, that would go back about 600 years before him. You know, maybe 500. So there's a long gap of time there. And, and now the world's starting to speak Latin. Jerome is living on the, in, you know, yeah, yeah, he's coming out of uh, Eastern Europe there. Um, we're about out of time, so um, I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll pick up with these, but we've got our Syriac version. Let me jump ahead. This is an interesting one, the, the Samaritan Pentateuch. There are still Samaritans in the world today. There's a Samaritan community that exists um, in their homeland. And the Samaritans break away from the Judeans after the Assyrian invasion of the people, um, you know, they kick out the Assyrians. And so those northern tribes, they, um, you know, they intermarry with the Samaritans, and that's what starts the whole tension between the Judeans, the Jews, and the Samaritans. You can see right here on the scroll, this is Samaritan script. It's a different alphabet. It's still considered a form of Hebrew or Samaritan. I, I really don't know how it's classified as a language family. But they got their own alphabet, even, which looks different. You start, you start looking at their documents because they preserved it. Of course, they've got their Pentateuch. And by the way, in their Bible, it's those 
It's those five books, the books of Moses. And then there is Joshua, which they don't consider part of the legitimate Bible, but it's still important. It's very strict. When we look at their documents that they have, they've got all these manuscripts. And I think that at some point within the last 20 years, a printed edition of it came out by one of their own scholars who did that. We find out that other than about 6,000 minor variants, it lines up with that Masoretic text, with that reliable, consistent Hebrew witness. And these are from people who don't agree with each other. These are from people who were at odds with each other. Now, there is an exception that wherever possible, when there's some text that talks about the temple being in Jerusalem, they change it. They would say that the Jews changed it. But if the real reading is Mount Gerizim. And you say, we all are changing that. No, they changed it. Okay. This is their theological agenda. So we know that this witness has a bias, and we can work with that. But this just illustrates the story in John's gospel when Jesus meets the Samaritan woman. She says, my people say we're supposed to worship on the mountain. Your people say you're supposed to worship in the temple. Jesus says, yeah. We worship what we know. You worship what you don't know. But the day's coming when we're going to worship. God's going to be seeking worshipers in spirit and truth. And the Genesis story in the yeah. Syrian Pentateuch would be very similar to the Hebrew Pentateuch. Oh, yeah. 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 In every other instance, other than anything having to do with Mount Gerizim and Temple, there's going to be a lot of consistency uh, from what I understand. I mean, these 6,000 variants, and 6,000, that's not very many variances when you consider the entirety. There tend to be maybe differences in phrasing, word order, stuff like that. They don't, they don't change the meaning. As a follow-up to what Jerry just asked. Yeah. If I understand correctly, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity all believe in the Pentateuch. Now, in terms of reliability, are all three similar so that they basically support each other in terms um, of reliability? Okay, by reliability, you mean their, their consistency in preserving? Well, if the writings are the same from way back when, mm -hmm. you would think that all three would have would minor exceptions yeah. and variances. Well, I, can't speak, I can't speak for Islam. I don't know their, their history and traditions, but Samaritans then, if you include them as an additional group, yeah. <clears throat> the understanding of the Pentateuch is going to be very similar. Of course, Jerome, uh, we go back to him, he's doing this as a Christian. He's working from the Hebrew text into Latin as a Christian, so he's he's respecting that, that tradition. That, Christians own this Bible uh, in the same way. Uh, Rick, I think the Islam versions of the stories of Abraham and Ishmael don't match up very well with the Hebrew versions. They get very, they, they get very... Yeah, I don't uh, know. Proprietary. Uh, there, there's a lot of their writings that are strange. Uh, They're going to give Ishmael a lot more credit. No, they, yeah. yeah. Of course, keep in mind that that all comes about, you're talking 7th century AD. So that's developing a lot longer. That would mean that your Christian uh, Bibles or texts have pretty much crystallized at that point, both in the church in the East and the church in the West. And your Hebrew tradition, that's right about the same time that the Masoretes are being, they're into their work. Of preserving that, so those are those are fairly well set, and it's off of that then that uh, Muhammad and the Islamic tradition they, they build off of that. And, uh, again, I'm, I'll speak. I don't. That's about my the extent of my knowledge on that. But we've got good reliable history. Now, we've just done the Old Testament. Um, when you enter the New Testament, it gets even more exciting. And let me just. Wrap it up there and tell you that I thank you very much for your participation. And stay in touch with me and let me know which direction you want this to go in because I want to make this interesting to you. And um, this is the this is the strange stuff, but it's going to get it's going to get a little closer to home as we keep going on. So thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you, Chris.